Well, in this session, we're going to be exploring system simulation. Now, this is building on our developing understanding of how we can use systems thinking and systems modeling to better understand various organizations. Now, this goes beyond where you are expected to be for your assessment simulation, but it does give you a little bit more perspective on how we can use system simulations as a research methodology or as a research method to assist in various methodological approaches to explore and better understand, particularly organizational dynamics. But there are many instances where we can use system simulation as part of a research process and particularly around various educational technology initiatives. So, this session, we're going to be exploring system simulation processes in a little bit more detail, and in particular focusing on identifying the leverage points within a system that we can better understand and affect change to that system. So one of the particular things that we can modify within a system, and in our case, a system model, that can then impact upon change within that system. Now, within system simulations and system models, we can see the effects of that change quite readily. Observing the effects of changes in a organizational system, for example, is more difficult because sometimes that change can take a while to permeate throughout the system. And indeed, sometimes it may be hidden from us. And that's where the advantage of using systems modeling is we can explore and ideate various possibilities without necessarily having to try them out and explore whether or not they work in a real system environment. Although, of course, the benefit of research is that eventually we should be able to apply that in real situations and see that have an impact upon those organizational changes. So in the tutorial this week, we're going to be discussing your organizational model and the various leverage points within your organization that you may be able to identify that you can apply a particular focus to in your intervention, in your transformation plan, that will have the greatest impact upon your intervention that you're hoping to achieve in the organization. So that's why we're using the systems modeling. Yes, it helps us understand the system and the organization in more detail, but in particular, if it can identify those key um, fulcrum points, points where we can apply a reasonably small amount of effort that will have a disproportionate impact upon the organization in terms of benefit towards what we want to try to achieve. Okay, so system simulations essentially allow us to better understand the dynamic processes occurring within a system. And we've been exploring a whole lot of very simple systems, but these systems can, even though they represent relatively simple dynamics, many real world um, processes are relatively simple, not all. And certainly if we want to fully understand a complex human based system that can involve many hundreds, if not thousands of variables, systems can very quickly become too complex to be able to simulate and model. But nevertheless, we can explore the basic fundamentals of a system by building system simulations of the, the system that we want to want to study. Okay, so the first model is an educational game called Minecraft, which is used in a lot of schools um, where students can build and create and explore various concepts. And I just wanted to give you an example of one using um, the tool that you've been exploring and allow you to um, see how it can be used in a relatively complex manner to show various processes. Now, the point where you start the loopy simulation can have an impact upon how the simulation flows out. If you start by increasing the amount of time students play the game, um, that's one way of starting things. Another way of starting things might be to increase the, the budget in the school and how that might affect things. So the model can be impacted fairly dramatically by where it is started. Um, and likewise, how long the model runs for 
can have quite a dramatic impact. If you're just flowing through a single iteration, that's one process, but often, particularly in easy to use simulations such as um, this one, we will allow it to run many, many cycles and we can see how things change over a considerable period of time or considerable number of iterations and interactions. So explore the model and just see what is it telling you? And in particular, what you should be looking for are what are the key areas that will have the greatest impact? Now, these tend to be those that have the greatest number of lines going out and into. Not always, but very often that's the case. So in this one, a central uh, factor is the game itself, how often it is played. But budget is also relatively important, as is training. They have a number of interactions, whereas things such as creativity may not necessarily have a big impact. It's only got one element coming in and one element coming out. So you can consider those aspects that are most significant or important in exploring the simulation. And we can see some things there around parent, um, parental res resistance and things like that, where there is a double line coming into that, which is increasing its effect. Likewise, a double line um, around teacher workloads. So the degree of impact has been shown in Blockly um, through the use of these double lines, sorry, in Loopy, through the use of these double lines. Whereas in more complex simulations, we would give numerical weightings to our links. And that would be an indicator of the strength of impact of those various connections. So this is then the what's called the predator-prey model. This is probably the most um, succinct and well-used example of simulation modeling. So here we have a certain number of um, animals that are preyed upon and a certain number of animals which are prey. So in this case, we have using moose and wolves. So there are a certain number of wolf, uh, moose being born each year and a certain number dying each year, which gives us a stock of the number of moose that are in this ecosystem. Likewise, there are a certain number of wolves being born each year and a certain number of wolves dying each year, which gives us a stock of wolves in the system. And these can be um, adjusted by birth rates and death rates. Um, now, the birth rate for moose isn't affected by anything else in this particular system, but the birth rate for the wolves is affected. The more moose that are available in the ecosystem, the greater the birth rate, because there's more food available for the wolves to eat. Likewise, the number of deaths for, for the moose is impacted by the number of wolves that are in the ecosystem. The more wolves, the greater likelihood of moose being eaten and dying. But the number of wolf, wolf death isn't incorporated into this particular model. So this is a, what's a balancing loop where we see the population of moose increase which leads to a population of the wolves increase, that at some point the number of wolves starts impacting upon the number of moose and the moose population decreases, followed then by the wolf population decreasing. Of course, there's not enough moose to sustain the population of the wolves. That at some point the wolf population decreases to a point whereby the moose population is then able to re-increase again. And then that cycle continues. So have a look at the predator-prey model and how we can use that to explore various concepts. Taking us back into education, um, this is a model around active learning, where we're doing active activities where students are engaged with doing something that supports their learning processes. It's a particular pedagogical model within teaching and learning. And there are various factors that we can put into play, such as student resistance and faculty resistance, 
uh, student expectations, academic outcomes, student capability, student confidence, things of that nature. Then it can also be the space. Um, and this is something we're going to look at, at towards the end of today's session, um, how the classroom is arranged and the furniture can play a role in active learning. If there is an open space where we can rearrange desks into small groups and things like that, then active learning can be supported more. If it's everyone is sitting in rigid rows that can't be rearranged, that makes it harder to achieve active learning environments. So again, this is a relatively simple model that's used to try to explain what may occur in implementing an active learning intervention into a educational organization. Okay, this one is a little bit more complex, and this is looking at a general school improvement or educational organization improvement model. So again, has some parallels to some of the approaches you've been using in your own um, intervention simulation uh, and looks at a range of different factors that can impact upon a school improvement process and how various interrelationships such as community support, teacher proficiency level, uh, the school culture um, can all have impacts upon the, the school's improvement processes. So again, you may find some ideas in looking at this model that may assist you in, your, in the development of your own um, system model. And this one goes a little bit more into looking at um, educational rankings. So comparing different educational organizations with one another. Uh, for example, comparing state or um, country uh, systems. So comparing, for example, the Indonesian education system with the Singaporean education system. What would be various factors that would be looked at in um, developing rankings that could be used to measure performance. Um, and this is what this particular model is used for, to try to um, explore what things can be measured in an organization that could then be used to create a ranking that could be used to then compare different organizations with other organizations. So again, somewhat different to the approach you're doing around an educational technology intervention, but still within the framework of education and looking at using system modeling and simulation to better understand what's involved in the ranking process and in the comparison of different organizations with one another. Okay, and this is a little bit more abstract. This is a more general growth model. Um, so looking at an economic system as a whole um, and how uh, the organism or the country, generally used for as a country, can grow uh, in terms of the number of jobs available, the industrial capital, the um, service capital, the um, agricultural environment um, can all be interrelated by different factors, by the labor force, by the agricultural inputs, how much um, fertilizer and um, pesticides and so forth are added, um, and various other factors. But again, it's being used to try to model um, a system, particularly around the utilization of labor, and how that can be impacted upon by various factors. Now, at the moment, in many countries, we're seeing a, a problem with a lack of available labor, um, where many employment areas are finding it difficult to attract workers, um, partly because of the pandemic, where workers were restricted in movement. But that is now continuing on, where a number of workers have um, identified that they can live on less and um, there's a significant labor shortage in many Western countries. So there would be economists and politicians and so forth looking at these sorts of models to try to understand what is occurring with the labor forces and try to see what factors can be adjusted, such as 
um, improvement of wages or improvement of benefits or bringing in external workers from outside the system, from other countries. These are all different factors that can be brought to play that will have various impacts upon the system that's being explored. Okay, this model looks at job automation. So the idea again of labor forces being automated by computers and robots and other um, technologies that and what that effect will have upon the labor workforce and the general um, employment uh, system. So again, that could be thought of what it happens if we automate some processes within education. Um, let's say we automate um, marking and test, test giving that can be taken outside of education and done through autonomous processes, either by external organizations doing so or by computerized AI systems um, doing so. What effect might that have upon the organization? Would we need then less teachers um, or could teachers be reutilized in other ways and to doing other things? Or would just free up teachers and have better um, employment outcomes for teachers and um, engagement uh, processes around retention and uh, workload stress and work-life balance and things of that nature. So again, these sorts of processes can be used to explore a whole range of different ideas and um, concepts. And we can build these models and then use other research techniques such as interviews or um, experimental modeling in organizations to try out these ideas and see if they actually fit the model. And the final um, simulation here is around um, weight loss and different approaches to be taken to achieving different levels of weight loss um, by um, modifying caloric intake at various times of day in the morning in the evening and through drinks and through snacks and various things like that, and also modifying the uh, amount of exercise being taken. And so you can adjust these various um, approaches and you can observe whether or not weight would be expected to increase or decrease and by how much by trying out different approaches. So, and again, it can then be identified what might be the most significant um, factors that would have the greatest impact. Is it more exercise? Is it reducing calories? Um, is it reducing when the calories are taken in the morning or in the, in the evening? Um, and these are things that this particular model can be used to explore. Now, these models don't necessarily give us an opportunity to delve into the stock flow diagrams. Um, we can simply modify various variables and the simulation then um, carries that out. Unfortunately, they don't give us access to the stock flow diagrams in some of these simulations, but they all do have a stock flow diagram base model underlying them. And this model looks at the early childhood education system and the various factors that can be applied um, and the effects that they then have upon the system. So again, explore this. We will also have a look at it during the tutorial and then discuss how these different models um, impact upon the system as a whole. And in particular, what I want you to do as you look at these various models is to think about what are the key factors that can change within the system that you can have some sort of change over that will then have a flow on effect that will be significant. Because that's the sorts of things you're going to be looking for in your system model to then justify a focus on that in your transformation plan because it will have a significant impact upon the system as you want to see it occur. This is a university enrollment growth model looking at um, what factors could be implemented to increase the number of students and faculty and um, student performance and uh, various other ratings that would be involved in a university environment. Now this image only shows a small part of that model, but if you go in and look at the model, you'll be able to see that there are lots of factors that are considered that again 
what are the key factors? What are the factors that if we modify will then flow through and have a significant effect upon the model? And we can only really look at that by simulating, by running the simulation. Of course, they can often have multi multiple order effects that can take a while to permeate through the system and then show an impact. And these are just... Okay, so share some of the thoughts that you have explored and learnt about um, these simulation models and how you've used them to explore these ideas into Teams. Now we have a couple of readings that lead into the next phase, our next module, which is going to be looking at policy. Um, and I want you to start off by considering policy by looking at one particular policy that I touched on earlier, and that was around classroom environments. Um, one of the policies we get to shape in educational organizations is how we structure the school environment, the classroom environments, the learning environments that students will be involved in and some of the impacts that how we shape that environment may have upon policy. Um, does it have an impact upon student outcomes? Um, does it have an impact upon say cheating and our policies we may have around student um, integrity? Does it have an impact upon student behavior and the policies we put into place around uh, behavior? Um, does it have an impact upon student IT use and how and when they use different technological devices? Um, could also have an impact upon um, pedagogical policies and approaches we use within an organization around pedagogy. So we're going to be exploring the idea of policy from a quite a broad framework, um, drawing upon the various factors that you've already been looking at in our first two modules but then going into policy development. And essentially policy development is around coming up with the, the mechanisms within an organization that lead the organization towards the process that you want to see it occurring within the organization. Uh, so they're not just all negative policies as you don't do this, you shouldn't do this. Many of our policies will be positive around we want to set up a framework that encourages learning in this way. We want to set up a enterprise bargaining process that allows um, all employees to feel empowered, but also allowing the organization to remain profitable and, and things like that. So there's a, lot, a whole range of policy settings, ways we set up the organization to work efficiently and effectively. And you should be starting to see that there are some relationships then we can take to the settings that we put in place in our organizational models and our simulations where many of these factors that influence our organizational model become policies within the organization that then um, direct our organization to have various processes flow through the organization in a way that we see in our simulation models but are more as more affected by policies because you are going to be developing the policies for your organization that will help support your transformation plan. And that's what we're going to be exploring over the next three weeks. And there's a little video here to, to have a look at around flexible learning environments. So in the tutorial this week, we're going to discuss um, an organizational learning environment in terms of how we can structure the organization or the environment in an organization to best support the organizational outcomes, not just for students, but also for staff and for cleaners and for um, a whole range of different key stakeholders. As we've been seeing through our simulation modeling, any policy, any anything we put into place in an organization impacts upon lots of different factors. So these are things that we'll be exploring and we're going to use flexible learning environments as a, an example of that to start our exploration in the tutorials. So share to Teams your idea about how changing a learning environment and how technology might be able to support changes to the learning environment that you are proposing. 
and come to a tutorial prepared to discuss how simulations can help understand learning environments. So that's it for this week, and I look forward to discussing these issues with you in the tutorial.